Well, since I can't play the DMC5 demo, I guess I'll finally get to making that video people have been asking for. So in 2009, Platinum Games Bayonetta came out to critical acclaim. The characters were fun and enjoyable, it had an amazing in-depth combat system with accessories and tools that further added to it, and the ending was easily one of the most ridiculous, over-the-top conclusions of anything, all of which we covered in a previous video. While Devil May Cry will always stand as the original king, Bayonetta definitely carved out its own place as the rival stylish character action game. And yes people, I'm still pushing character action as a thing. There was a pure sense of stylish action that bled through everything about it that ended up creating a rather substantial fanbase of its own, which then launched Platinum Games into the limelight. They made a few other titles before and shortly after that gained a significant cult following, but Bayo was the name everyone knew them for. From there, Platinum would continue making more games with a similar design philosophy of Bayonetta's hyperactive climax action, which only further pushed their recognition as a studio known for high quality gameplay. With all this said, it seemed like a sequel to Bayonetta was almost inevitable, especially with the creators regularly teasing the idea of it causing a stir in the fans. But that raises the question of, how would someone follow up something as bombastic and crazy as Bayonetta? Sequels almost always feel the need to escalate what the previous installments did, either through mechanics or the story. So where do you go from punching a god into the sun? Well, only the creators would really know. So earlier this year, I traveled all the way to the Shin Omeda building in Osaka, Japan, where the Platinum Games office is located, in order to find out. Only to get told to get lost. Which means I guess I'm gonna have to do this one on my own. Well, there's only one way to ring in the new year, so let's dance, boys. Welcome to my Bayonetta 2 retrospective. So, very much like the beginning of Bayonetta 2, let's start where the last game left off at. As I talked about in the previous video, the first Bayonetta was essentially a way for the director, Hideki Kamiya, the creator of Devil May Cry 1 who was denied the opportunity to make a sequel, to create a sort of spiritual successor to DMC, as it acted as a surrogate for all the ideas he'd had since working in Capcom Studio 4. So he and the game's producer, Yusuke Hashimoto, were ecstatic to see the critical success the game gained upon its release, and started progressively throwing around ideas for what they could do for a possible sequel almost immediately after. While other projects were in development at Platinum, with the Arena Fighter Anarchy Reigns or Hideo Kojima coming to them to create the Metal Gear action spin-off game Rising Revengeance, work on the second game continued progressively in the background with Kamiya teasing the eventual return of Bayonetta when fans would ask him on Twitter. However, as it would come to be known, Kamiya wouldn't be. At least in the same way he had before. Something interesting when you take a look at Kamiya's history as a games director is that he's never gotten to work on a proper sequel to any of his games before, for one reason or another. With DMC, Capcom went to a different development team for the second game, with Beautiful Joe, he was busy with Okami at the time of the second game's development, and then with Okami, the development studio, Clover Studios, was closed shortly after the game's release, leading to the formation of Platinum Games. And this trend seemed to have followed him all the way to Platinum. Likely due to working on other projects at the time, and other issues that will come to shortly, Kamiya ended up not staying on the sequel to Bayonetta as its director further continuing this trend that he had come to terms with at this point. However, Kamiya did stay on as writer and supervisor for the project since he was the one that came up with a lot of the lore of Bayonetta's world, 
while Yusuke Hashimoto, who acted as the producer for the first game and did a lot of programming and art design work throughout the industry, acted as the new director. Aside from his jack of all trades skill set, Yusuke was extremely familiar with the first game, even designing most of the enemies used in it, so it was a logical choice to make him the one to oversee the sequel, with Kamiya giving advice to the team while he continued to develop other projects. With a lot of the devs from the original Team Little Angel returning for the sequel, development for Bayonetta 2 seemed to be going extremely well from the start. However, as it continued, a much bigger problem came up. Early on into the game's development, Platinum's longtime publisher Sega became disinterested in publishing a second Bayonetta game. While the first game sold fairly well for an original IP from a fairly unknown studio at the time, it didn't sell well enough that Sega was willing to go in on a sequel, especially because the company wasn't doing so well for itself in the early 2010s, and was racing to the mobile market as it started shutting down western branches and arcade centers in Japan left and right. So their publishing deal with Platinum wasn't renewed, with Anarchy Reigns being the last game of theirs to be published by Sega, which meant a lot of trouble for the titles the dev studio had in the works. Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, which was already deep into development, was being published by Konami rather than Sega, so it wasn't affected by this sudden change. But this lack of a proper publisher resulted in Bayonetta 2 languishing in development hell for quite a bit. Now, Platinum could have potentially kept working on it on their own, but Bayo 2 was planned to be an even bigger game than the first so it needed the extra assistance from a publisher to help fund the necessary development costs of something this large scale. Platinum shopped around Bayo 2 to a few other studios to find someone to help publish and fund the game, but no one seemed really interested in it, and for a while it looked like it wasn't going to go anywhere, resulting in the game being terminated completely. That was until Nintendo descended onto the studio, who agreed to step in with additional funding for the game under the preface that it would be exclusive to Nintendo. At the time, Nintendo's successor console to the Wii, the Wii U, was in early development, and Nintendo was scrounging up developers to make titles for its launch window. They were already working with Platinum on their Super Sentai Homage Wonderful 101, which up until that moment was being made for just the Wii. So when they heard there was issues happening with Bayonetta 2's development, a sequel to a game that sold fairly well to an underserviced niche audience, they offered to help with the development, with Sega acting as an advisor since they still maintained the rights to the IP. So after showing off Wonderful 101 during the Wii U's launch preview direct in late 2012, Nintendo announced that the sequel to Bayonetta would also be coming exclusive to the console with a teaser trailer which caused a bit of a stir. For fans of the first game, which was on both the PS3 and the Xbox 360, it was frustrating seeing the game being locked onto one of Nintendo's consoles, especially since that console was the Wii U, which now that almost everything worthwhile on it has been ported over to the Switch in one form or another, can be stated as an otherwise utter commercial failure for Nintendo that no one really wanted which also meant many didn't end up playing Bayo 2 until it arrived on the Switch years later. And even then, some weren't happy that Bayonetta was a property of Nintendo now after being on multiple platforms at the start. However, as Kamiya and other people at Platinum have had to repeatedly inform begrudging fans over the years, if it wasn't for Nintendo, the game wouldn't have been made. So it's the conundrum of would you want something as an exclusive release or not exist at all? Because as established, that's the situation Platinum was faced with when Nintendo approached them. Yes, it would be nice if the game was released on other systems that, well, people owned, but in a world where consoles have to be sold, exclusives are a sadly necessary sales tactic. And in a way, it worked for Nintendo if only marginally. I know I bought a Wii U largely so that I could play Bayonetta 2. However, that wasn't the only concern going on leading up to the sequel's release in relation to Nintendo. 
Exclusivity aside, there was also an underlying fear that Nintendo was going to sanitize Bayonetta. The first game became well known for Bayo's very sexualized character and riskier sequences in the story that were both campy and self-aware with how exaggerated they were, whereas Nintendo is known for being very family friendly with the games that are under their publishing umbrella. So there was an assumption that they might strong arm Platinum into toning it down. But with that in mind, would Nintendo have agreed to publish the game if they weren't already aware of what they were getting into? In fact, going from interviews, the Nintendo producers that oversaw the project gave the devs at Platinum a lot of creative control and free reign on it, trusting that they knew what they were doing after working with them on Wonderful 101. Though Platinum did play certain things safe considering who their new publisher was. So some possible alternate costumes that were drawn up didn't make it in for likely valid reasons. But even the devs might have assumed too much about their new publisher. Because one day during the game's development, Kamiya simply walked up to one of the designers of Platinum, Yong Hee Cho, and said, Hey Cho, draw Bayonetta in a Princess Peach outfit for me. Thanks. And then just walked away, leaving the designer baffled, possibly wondering if this was just for his personal collection. I mean, would Nintendo really let them put Bayonetta in some sexy cosplay based off one of their most iconic E for Everyone characters? Platinum was a Japanese studio, and as such had a lot of diehard Nintendo fans in its employ since they were the OG Japanese game studio. So when it was confirmed that Nintendo was going to allow them to incorporate some of their classic properties into their game for some fun fan service, they were extremely excited at the idea of it. Nintendo was surprisingly willing to allow Platinum to include some of their best known IPs in Bayonetta 2 in strange and unique ways. From alternate costumes and references to Star Fox and Metroid, and even using Mario's classic Chain Chomp enemy as a main weapon once you beat the game on hard mode, which supposedly the director requested assuming he would be told no. Upon seeing preliminary designs, Nintendo went so far as to ask that their Link costume be a bit more revealing to better suit Bayonetta's general aesthetic. So as more directs, trailers, and platinum blog posts came up, the public started to see that this was still the same Umbran Witch that they loved from Bayonetta 1, which was helped with the fact that the game was being released along with an updated version of the first Bayonetta so that those who never played it could catch up on story details since it was never put onto a Nintendo console. Despite some concerns that Bayonetta wouldn't fit with Nintendo's overall brand, the company was all too ready to pair it with the rest of its IPs, which likely played no small part in the Witch's inclusion into the Smash Brothers roster years later, while maintaining what it was that the fans loved about it in the first place. But this is all the superficial Nintendo dealings. While being able to turn the jets into our wings or transforming into Samus's morph ball are fun little inclusions, there were design elements that only Platinum could handle, especially when it came to evolving what they did with the previous game. When Platinum was looking at how to approach Bayonetta 2, a lot of creating the sequel came down to fine-tuning what they had done with the previous game, which was its own problem, but we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves on that one. Platinum Games never had created a direct sequel to one of their works before. Anarchy Reigns doesn't quite count since it was more a spiritual successor to Mad World than any type of proper follow-up. So there was a lot of self-reflection on how they could build on their work. Examining what problems players had with the first, making improvements to the designs, even just going as far as noting how the enemies only had one animation for when they were hit, no matter the direction of the impact. Hashimoto and the rest of the team went over all the elements they could improve on in order to make a game that could top the first, and one of the most noteworthy changes from the start was the visual aesthetic. One thing I noted when looking back at Bayonetta 1 after playing 2 was how drab it looked in a lot of scenes. There was some stunning visuals and fight choreography, but as a whole, there was an overabundance of greys and dark shadows in everything, likely to go with the ancient witch motif of the main character. But this resulted in a lack of contrast in the color palette, making it look slightly dingy when paired with the amount of gold lighting throughout. And this is a conclusion the development staff came to as well. 
When going over the original game, they came to the same result about the visual aspect and lack of color contrast in the world and wanted to fix that, starting by changing the base tone used. When creating a game early in the development stage, the conceptual designers slash artists will sometimes base the game's visuals and or tone off a base set of colors, then continue to build off that. Something the Persona games have been doing for years at this point. And the artists at Platinum did the same when they changed the color theme of 2 from the red and black used in the first game to blue and gold, which ended up influencing the entire game's aesthetic, and made it more vibrant as a result. Even simply comparing the prologue chapter of the first game to the sequel, you can see how drastic the differences actually are. Both involve a section in the city streets and a fight atop a flying vehicle with some over-the-top fight sequences, but when you look at the two together, the second game visually pops more. Not simply because the situation on display has more going on, or it had better graphics, but because there's more colors present that complement each other. The blue of the jet and angels along with the golden accents on each of them, the fleshed out cityscape during a light snow, and then as the chapter progresses and the enemies shift from the typical angels to Bayonetta's rampaging demon summon, the overall color tone shifts to a darker palette to both go with the demonic boss fight climbing a skyscraper and the change in status quo, before concluding on a setting sun as the fight comes to its conclusion. The first game had a lot of great sequences, but when looked at as a whole, the art of the second was a massive upgrade, especially later on once it gets to its most stunning visuals. Though, while the overall art direction of the game was given a drastic overhaul, the most notable change that can be seen in this intro is the redesign to Bayonetta herself. The original design for Bayonetta was intended to be a modern, fashionable take on the classic witch archetype, hence the hair being in a sort of French twist in order to emulate the typical hat they're often depicted with. And as an entirely original character, it was a strong look that made her immediately recognizable. But given her character was this stylish, fashionista type, it felt wrong to have her maintain the exact same look in a new game. So Mari Shimazaki, the freelance character designer who spent draft after draft trying to perfect Bayonetta's first design, returned for the sequel in order to give the witch a brand new look. This wasn't a simple change of the shirt or adding a jacket however, because due to the gameplay element of her clothing slash hair being a weapon during her wicked weaves, and the fact the player needs to be able to clearly see both the enemy and Bayonetta herself during combat, which was an issue they had trouble with the first time around, there had to be a lot of consideration into what could be changed. So going with the base tone shift between titles, the red that the original design had was swapped for a bit of blue, with her outfit being recolored slightly, even changing her trusted gun Scarborough Fair to Love is Blue as a way to fit the new aesthetic of the game and her own design. Along with those changes, her haircut was given a stylish new pixie cut trim, and the hair fringes off her arms were refashioned into a new poncho slash cape design from some older concept art that was made to be a bit more sleek. Altogether, which gave her a specific new look that was mature yet intimidating. Luxurious, but also a bit fierce. Typically, it can be rather troublesome redesigning characters that have a well-known design to them, but overall, Shimizaki did a great job at refashioning Bayonetta's iconic design while even making improvements to it. And that isn't even counting the amount of awesome alternate costumes included in the game that had to go with these changes. You know I try to avoid doing this in my Sunday best. <laughs> Everyone who isn't wrong knows that Bayonetta's redesign in 2 was a massive improvement though. The real important redesign is in fact Jean, who's just... Mwah. Beautiful. Personally, I never dug the shorter cut or Princess Leia buns on John in the first game, so giving her the thigh length hair with a side part that covers one eye, along with changing her outfit to a red leather biker suit, was a drastic improvement that ended up complementing the new look Bayonetta has. And considering the central thrust of the story is for Bayonetta to save her old friend's soul from hell, it was important to make the player feel an even greater drive to save her, which this new look gave them. And this assertion is based off of years of diligent research into player psychology and totally not some sort of weird personal bias I have. 
Oh, and some of the other characters also got redesigns. They're pretty good. But going over all the changes, Hashimoto realized if the main cast were all going to get a total makeover, it would seem odd for them to be fighting these same old enemies. So they too were revamped. The classic enemies from Bayonetta 1, like the Affinity and the Beloved, did make appearances later into the game as you revisit some familiar stages. However, for the majority of the game, all the Angels of Paradiso were brand new, with their own mechanics and designs to distinguish them, such as the base enemies being changed to a centaur build that reacted differently to the way the Affinity did, or the Valiance-type angels, whose biggest weakness is actually the sword it swings around due to it also being the head, which is possibly one of my favorite designs in the entire series. Though the biggest mix-up with the enemies wasn't the introduction of newer angels used for combo practice, but the inclusion of infernal demons into the enemy pool. Going with the theme of chaos and loss of balance in the game's story, it was decided fairly early on that it would be interesting to incorporate the demons that sided with the Umbran Witches as they started to turn on their masters, further expanding on the enemies Bayonetta has to fight as she delves into Inferno. As a contrast to the holy, statuesque aesthetics of the angels from Paradiso, the demons were made to have a more mechanical, reptilian design to them as a way to fit with their hell motif, utilizing darker colors for their armor and or scales on top of which all have their own unique movesets and weapons to use. From the Sloth's fast multiple sword strikes, to the Resentment being able to turn their enemies into children. The more diverse amount of enemies from both Heaven and Hell meant not only a larger pool of enemies to carve up, but also more complexity to the ways the player has to approach these fights since all of them were designed to react and attack differently from each other. However, before we can really get into how the enemies factored in the combat, we first have to talk about the changes to the combat itself. Now, the most challenging thing to approach when it came to developing a sequel to Bayonetta was the gameplay. Platinum Games has always created titles built around the concept of feeling satisfying to play, which the first Bayonetta alone highly demonstrated perfectly pairing an attack with a Moon of Mahakala accessory, a really good aerial combo with a quality Red Hawk kick, even just getting the final press of a combo to get the impact of hitting an enemy with a massive fist was also satisfying. The concept of Witch Time itself was basically designed around giving the player a reward for pulling off dodges at the last second like a badass. So with Bayonetta 1 already being this high class level of combat design, where was there to really go? With 2, the overall mechanics of the combat was kept largely the same. The ability to equip weapons to both Bayonetta's arms and legs, changing up the combos that you can do depending on which you pick, a combo scoring system built around maintaining your damage output and using taunts and witch times to maximize the results, with approximately 6 seconds between hits before it's reset, and the ending of interrupted combos resulting in a powered up wicked weave attack. However, knowing how certain players abused it in the previous game, the devs additionally depowered the punch-kick-punch punch combo, as they understood it was an easy way to repeatedly spam Wicked Weaves, and wanted players to have to experiment and play around with some of the new weapons and mechanics. Though some still carried over similar aspects to previous weapons that were found to be vital to the gameplay. There's a sword weapon like Shiraba with Rakshasha, though now it's dual swords and has an alternate foot model to allow more versatility. Undyne replaces Daraja as the elemental type weapon with a heavier impact to it, though trades in some of its built-in speed to get that, along with removing the charge bomb attack, possibly as a way to nerf some of the mechanics that people had a tendency to spam, which I'm not 100% sure I agree with. Along those lines, Kulshadra was replaced by Urana as the whip type weapon, with a lot more crowd control and range options to its combos, along with being able to grab enemies and slam them around, including larger boss type enemies if they're vulnerable. However, I'm not sure why the ability to drag yourself towards your target was replaced, as it was a key element of how the whip was used in the previous game. This change doesn't make Alruna any less useful, but it's always odd seeing a key part of a toolkit removed with no clear reason why. 
Design change grips aside, each weapon has their own skill set and viability for getting those pure platinum ratings if used correctly along with others. As every weapon has their usefulness and unique combo list to it depending on what it's equipped with. So synergy between them can play a big part when learning how to utilize them to their fullest. Kafka for example may seem weak, only being really useful in a certain boss fight at first glance, but its long range, quick shots, ability to pass through defenses, and power to attack multiple enemies or stack them onto one in an instant with its bullet climax functions means it has a lot of uses when mixed together with some of the closer range weapons. Salamandra on the other hand is more about chipping away the enemy's defenses with extended close range attacks, with a timing mechanic to it that allows for more hits if released at the correct time, which ups the combo rankings that it can earn, meaning it's extremely useful for earning pure platinum ratings. And while Lieutenant Kilgore will always be my favorite weapon of the series, and I would have liked to see it return, Takami Kazuchi, followed by Chain Chomp, comes in a very close second as they have a satisfying amount of impact to their attacks and combo enders, and are good setup weapons for combos due to the amount of stun they can do, especially after a full charge hit. Yes, at a surface level, some of the tools in Bayonetta's arsenal don't appear as strong comparatively, and a couple of them do have more advantages to them over others when it comes to getting the most out of the combat, but all of the weapons do have a lot of uses to them, with none of them being entirely useless. And the fun of the game is experimenting with what works and how to best utilize them along with your individual playstyle and the mechanics given to you. Which brings me to the first major mechanical change, and that is the Umbran Climax. In the previous game, there was a sort of lore-based mechanic exclusive to larger boss fights called Serious Mode, which changed all regular attacks to bigger Wicked Weave type ones and upped the power of the actual Wicked Weaves that would end combos. But in 2, it was changed to act as a form of devil trigger that could be used on command if the player had enough magic stored up. On top of making it usable at all times, allowing you to deal more damage to a wider group, Umbrid Climax also buffed the Wicked Weave Enders with full summons of demons associated to the weapons being used, further maximizing the impact finalizing combos had. In terms of mechanics that utilize the magic system of the game, Umbrid Climax effectively replaced the torture attack or at least made it less essential to the combat. The torture attack still has its place if you want high damage on a single enemy with a lot of health that needs to be gotten rid of quickly, but Umbran Climax is much more versatile across the entire game, as powerful enemies can't be tortured, and is essential when dealing with groups of enemies since the attacks have a huge amount of range and stun lock. On top of that, another major benefit to Umbran Climax is it grants Bayonetta a bit of super armor as well as a way to break free from enemy attacks that lock you in place due to the burst that happens upon being triggered. The torture attacks, while having a fun camp value to seeing Bayonetta put her enemies through some heavy BDSM moves, felt like it slowed down the combat a tad, stopping to have a 5 second button mashing QT, whereas Umbran Climax was a good way to up the amount of damage while keeping the fast paced combos going. So while it can feel a bit broken in places, it was a massive net gain to the actual gameplay. Combat in these games is massively improved the more choices the player is allowed to make, from weapons, mechanics, and abilities, which Bayonetta 2 gives in spades. Between the different weapons that can be selected, a lot of returning skills and accessories, and Umbran Climax. But it also expects the player to be able to handle more from the combat, and that is expressed most in how the enemies react to the player in the game. Almost every enemy in 2, at least the mid-sized ones and up, has a stronger defense to them. Being able to shrug off attacks with a block move if they aren't completely stunned, or being able to use dodge moves. Which was also a thing in 1, but was increased a bit with the sequel as a way to push you into getting better with the mechanics. And this is where things like Witch Time, Umbrin Climax, and Dodge Offset mechanics were given more importance to the game's overall design, as they are key ways of opening up enemies for longer combo strings. This tweak to the combat results in many enemies feeling less like combo fodder and more like an actual challenge to Bayonetta, since you had to work a bit harder to make them vulnerable. And without relying on things like the on-fire angels of one that actively damaged you if they weren't caught in the slowdown time, or gold angels that remove the witch time mechanic entirely. 
Now, it's understandable why these tweaks can be frustrating to some players, as enemies blocking has been a heavy criticism of the game for years, which has validity to it. Being in the middle of setting up a stylish combo string, only to be halted in your tracks midway through because an enemy wasn't stunned can be frustrating, especially for those coming off the first game that want the same pure combo potential that it had. However, I'd argue that this was an improvement in the long term, or at least makes it more interesting. In 2, the player has to better balance offense and defense in what they're doing, as enemies are no longer just offensive themselves. Mashing buttons in order to get out constant wicked weaves isn't going to keep every enemy stunned as much as in the previous game, so you need to keep a better eye on how they might be reacting, and put them in a situation where they're more vulnerable, whether that's getting them into a proper stun state, into the air, or going into witch time. After replaying this game for the last 3 weeks on repeat, set to varying difficulties, along with previous playthroughs beforehand, I found that the changes to the way the enemies reacted and blocked became less and less of an issue as my skills developed, as I came to expect it and was able to plan around it, while still incorporating my own combos, and ended up having more fun with the gameplay because of it. Fights became almost like a give and take sort of dance, where as long as I was responding to what they were doing correctly, I could easily keep combos up while feeling more engaged with it. As I said, the critiques of the gameplay are 100% valid, as it's gonna be a matter of personal taste. And I'm coming from a more casual perspective compared to speedrunners or those who want to pure platinum the entire game on every difficulty. But when I think about what's more valuable to me in the long term when playing, I enjoy a game that actively challenges me more while giving me plenty of tools to beat it. And that's what I get from 2's combat. And with that said, now that probably a healthy percentage of people watching this have tuned out entirely due to those spicy hot takes there, that brings me to the part that I know only me and five other people care about, and that is the writing of Bayonetta. A rather significant critique for many who played Bayonetta 1 was... What the hell is going on here? There's something about magic eyes, an evil father figure revealed in the last hour, time travel is a thing for some reason. The way it was all presented made it extremely hard to keep track of, especially with the amount of insane set pieces that had very little connection to what was going on narratively, all of which Kamiya and Hashimoto went into the sequel with seemingly the intention of correcting, without retconning what they previously did. In fact, 2 retroactively improves on the story of the first game. That isn't to say the story is suddenly award winning, as Loki's cockiness can be a bit grating at times, but it's definitely an improvement nonetheless. To start, the game begins where the last left off, showing what has become of the main antagonist Boulder after his defeat to Bayonetta, as if to remind you of who this character is because it might come up later. Then it segues into where Bayonetta and John have been over the last few months since saving the world, with Enzo effectively giving a plot summarization of the last game's revelations. Some witch with amnesia goes around calling herself a weapon, and it turns out she really got stuck with a kid's nickname. That shit's rich, I tell you what. While everything seems peaceful, there's a feeling that something big was still coming, as there wouldn't be a game if there wasn't with Jean even dropping a line about how the demons in Inferno are getting antsy, which is paid off at the end of the chapter when the demon Gamora breaks free from Bayo's summoning and attempts to attack her, resulting in Jean dying to save her friend, which was a very emotional moment for the two considering how far they've come since the start of the last game. But before we get to that, since this is a Bayonetta game, we have to have an insane over the top set piece where Bayo fights groups of angels atop a speeding jet and a moving train. The whole rescue John soul from Inferno angle then ends up being the main driving force of the story for the first half of the game, though it's mostly used as a way to get the plot going forward, as Bayonetta wouldn't have had any other reason to get involved with the Loki and Lopter part of the story in the later half, which comes into play almost immediately going into chapter 1 once she gets to know it. At first glance, it seems like the story has two plotlines going on that have very little to do with each other, 
but the fight for Jean is more or less the B-plot, so to speak. That was a cause of Lopter and Loki's effect on the world, so it's more of a way of bringing the witches into the important narrative. Though I admittedly would have enjoyed a story entirely centered around Bayonetta saving Jean that explored their relationship now that they're both themselves. Can you believe they tore my dress to shreds? Right about here, I think it was. Absolutely criminal. There's such a thing as a time and a place. When it comes to the character writing, one arguably had the advantage of introducing Bayonetta, setting up a game for exploring who she is as we the audience come to appreciate her as a character thus making a more memorable experience. Though I would say the benefit that Bayonetta 2 gains from this is that we can further delve into her past and relationships as a result, despite the game not making it a clear central focus. Such as showing more of Bayo and Rodan's dynamic when she goes into his hunting ground in Hell. Damn woman, I thought I told you to cheat. I've heard complaints about Bayonetta's character in the sequel being less fun as she has less quippy one-liners and eccentric dance choreography in comparison. But within the narrative, this does make sense. She's more serious, says her friend died due to her summon, and she's on a time limit to save her. On top of then having to re-experience the extinction of her race. We still get those moments of a fun-loving, snarky Bayonetta, namely during the intro and ending sequences when her friend's life is no longer in the line, but a lot of the narrative is her dealing with heavier stuff. The story never makes Bayonetta's inner turmoil a focus, as the action spectacle is what the player paid for, though it is something that's there in the subtext. Mommy. In an interview, Kamiya stated he writes his action games around the action scenes he comes up with, and then builds the story around it with the intent of making it so that the player is continually interested in seeing what will happen which is quite noticeable with Bayonetta 1's structure, as it never goes into why anything's happening aside from the need to get to the next cool sequence. But I believe Bayonetta 2 does a better job of connecting its set pieces along with its story, as they feel more appropriate to what is happening. Trying to keep a story grounded while including massive amounts of spectacle is always going to be a challenge, as they're pretty much diametrically opposed. But something that always threw me off about Bayonetta 1 was that some of the locales never really made much sense for what the current story was aiming for, like the Colosseum being thrown into the sky or the motorbike sequence, clearly demonstrating that the story was built around the set pieces rather than naturally connecting to them. With 2, there's a more concentrated through line going from each location to the next, fitting where Bayonetta needs to be in relation to the story going from attempting to climb up to Fimbleventer, then to the gates of hell to save Jean, to being sent to the past to set up what happened during the war, and then returning to the present for the final showdown now that everything's been explained. I always appreciated Bayonetta 1's sense of spectacle, but there was always a feeling of confusion with what the point of it was, or where it was going toward since there was no clear goal in mind. Whereas with 2, it's quite easy to understand where it's all going and that isn't even getting into the polishing of the gameplay sections associated with a lot of the high spectacle moments, like the bike and jet sequences being revamped so that they're overall less frustrating to deal with. Consider this a momentary truce, at least until the encroachers are punished. Well, that's one way to do it. Here's mine. Time to tango. Now, admittedly, a shortcoming for the sequel is that the ending doesn't have the pure, over-the-top escalation of the last game, as much as it does try with everything Aesir Lopter throws at you. However, 2 makes up for it with a different sort of impact, and that is with an emotional climax. The entire game, Bayonet has been battling the Mass Lumen Sage, who she finds out to be a boulder from the past her father who she had to fight in the last game when he attempted to awaken the god Jubileus. Bayonetta gets to see the man her father was, and briefly work with him as father and daughter, learning to respect him as a fighter and parental figure, but just as quickly, also has to accept that what is happening to him after absorbing a defeated Lopter will result in her having to kill him in the past, all on top of reliving her mother's death. Rival characters are quite often the most interesting ones in the story, but rarely is there this much of a complicated emotional weight added to them, and the fact that young Baldur's contribution to the story retroactively improves his part in the last game 
as you see everything that led to him becoming the villain, was a smart writing move on the part of Kamiya. We may not seek our next step. We may stumble. We may fall off the path. But we always move forward. That is the power of man. So, with all this said, a question I found myself regularly coming back to while working on this project was, why then does the story part of Bayonetta 2 feel lesser than the first? Overall, it's a structural improvement and does a better job of fleshing out the world, explaining a lot of the time travel shenanigans going on. So, why does the confusing mess that is the first game seem stronger? Or at least, a bit more memorable? Well. I believe there's a couple reasons for this. One storytelling flaw of 2 is the constant switching between the ways information is conveyed to the player. Sprinkled throughout the earlier chapters of the game are these walk and talk sections, where you have to wait in game for Loki and Bayonetta to go over lines of dialogue before you can properly progress. Moments that can be skipped until after the first playthrough, and even then it slows you down while you mash through them. So you just have to slowly walk around until it finishes which seems extremely counterintuitive for a game that's all about keeping its high-paced action going at all times. I understand that these bits are meant to give a bit of character exposition to the player, but they bring both the gameplay and story to a grinding halt for about a solid minute, which ends up hurting the general interest of what's even being discussed in these sections. These admittedly only come up a few times, but then there's also the animatic scenes that are a much more common storytelling device which can look quite nice, as the clock framing was well designed, but when I think about how the visuals could be improved by having fully motion sequences, as you'd be better able to see the nuances of characters changing expressions or the impact of attacks, it's hard not to see these as a downgrade. I'm unsure if this was a stylistic or budgetary decision, as it's used so often throughout the entire game and is even spliced in with the regular scenes at random, but I think the story would have been greatly improved by uniformly sticking to fully motion cutscenes, since that is where it shines most. Weird framing devices I can partially ignore though, as it's mostly a problem with the presentation and was something that can be found in the first game. To me, the biggest issue with the story, despite the overall improvements it makes to Bayonetta's world, is that it lacked a compelling final antagonist. Baldur is a solid rival character throughout the story that develops as it continues, but Lopter themselves don't have anything that makes them truly stand out, which hurts the rest of the story, since a great true antagonist is what the game really needed. We don't know anything about this godly character and what his motives are, aside from regaining ultimate powers Aesir and ruling over humanity, as he sees free will as utterly pointless which in a modern context is extremely bog standard, and drags down the story slightly due to there not being anything more to it. There are villains that only see humans as a resource or tool that are amazing, but it all comes down to the nuance you give them and how that might evolve, which is something Lopter is greatly lacking in. If Kamiya narratively really built up Lopter in relation to Loki, even something as little as giving him his own personality quirks, or better highlighting how the two different parts of Aesir play off each other, since the final confrontation is the only time we really see them interact, we could have gotten a lot more out of him. But as he is, Lopter is an extremely forgettable villain, which ends up leaving a hole in the game's story in a rather significant way where it could have potentially reached something like DMC3 if it just did a bit more. And that ends up touching on one last glaring issue with two I have that needs to be addressed. At the end of the day, Hashimoto and the rest of Team Little Angels had the almost impossible task of taking something that was already stellar to begin with and improving on it with a sequel, which they did a very admirable job of, as it removed a lot of the design faults of the first. No more single button QTE fails, a more fleshed out story, a generally better art direction, and improvements to an already great combat system that, while removes some key elements that are sorely missed, 
added in mechanics that kept you on your toes. Taken as a whole, Bayonetta 2 was a strong follow-up to an already amazing game. However, this all ends up highlighting Bayonetta 2's biggest fault, and that is that it had to follow up Bayonetta 1. Despite polishing everything done with its predecessor and refining it, 2 results in being a bit less memorable as a result, since it's not standing on its own merits in the same way the first game did, presenting itself more like a 1.5 director's cut than a fully fledged continuation. Bayonetta 1 came out as a major surprise to a lot of people from a relatively fresh developer, and years later, the company would be known for it. So it's challenging to really evolve or change it too drastically without potentially stepping too far from what it was the people enjoyed about it. Even within this video, it's impossible for me to really talk about what this game does well without eventually comparing it to its predecessor. And that's because the devs designed it with that in mind. Bayonetta 2 is a quality game, there's no denying that. But paradoxically, its biggest struggle is that it only treats itself as a sequel, as the next one. Like the second child trying to prove that it's better than the first kid by doing all the same things better. It was so concerned with improving on the first game that it didn't reach as far as it very well could have and knowing the skills at Platinum with everything they've made before and after, there was definitely some untapped potential there. Hopefully with Bayonetta 3 announced, assuming we eventually get more than a 10 second teaser trailer, we will see a fully fledged sequel that meets all the potential Platinum has. But only time will really tell on that one. Now before I go, since this is my last video of 2018, I'd like to thank everyone who's taken the time to help this channel grow this year, whether that's subscribing, leaving likes, or commenting, even when it's opinions that differ from mine, or just asking if I'm a furry. I'd especially like to thank those of you who've supported me on Patreon over the last six months, as it means a lot to me that people are willing to support my work and makes me want to work that much harder. When 2018 started, I was just pushing past 3k subs. And now I'm on track to multiplying that by tenfold by the start of 2018, which, while still small in the grander scheme of things, is a much larger amount of growth than I ever expected to see. And it's thanks to all of you watching. And going into the new year, I hope I can continue developing my skills so that I don't disappoint you all who took the time to listen to some dude with a cartoon fox avatar talk about games and anime. So with that, Thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the new year.